Thank you very much, Shamira, for that kind introduction, and thank you very much for having me. My name is Karim al Asal, and I'm the Policy Director at Canada Visa, and I'm very pleased to be with you, uh, be here with you this morning to explore with you the topic of economic integration. So I'm curious to know before I begin, how many of us in this room by a show of hands are joining us from outside of Canada? Okay, so roughly one third. So the reason I ask is because I'm a Canadian, I'm going to be focusing my remarks on Canadian immigration, but hopefully you'll be able to draw parallels between what I have to say and the country context from which you um, originate from. And I also want to use this as a public service announcement to invite you all to apply for permanent residence to Canada. <laughs> we have a very open immigration system and the weather is like this all year round, <laughs> so you have nothing to worry about. And we will make the best of your skills and talents in our labor market. And I smile because I'm going to begin by providing an overview of the challenges that immigrants commonly face within the Canadian labor market. And I'm also going to speak to what I feel are some of the limitations in terms of how we measure the economic performance of immigrants here in Canada. And that's going to segue into the second part of my presentation, which is me providing what I feel is a more comprehensive framework in terms of measuring the performance of immigrants within the economy. And I'm going to conclude on a positive note, and I feel compelled to do so, because oftentimes this topic in Canada is clouded with negativity, and it doesn't need to be that way. And Recent evidence that has come to bear shows that immigrants are in fact have, having better outcomes and this trend should continue on the balance of probability moving forward. One of the most influential policy documents in history was released in this city back in 1966 and it's called the Canadian Federal White Paper on Immigration. And I say this because this was the document that served as the ground, or laid the groundwork for Canada launching the world's first ever economic class point system the following year in 1967, which has since been adopted by countries around the world. In that document contains this paragraph which outlines the challenges that immigrants faced back then in terms of getting their skills recognized by Canadian employers. And unfortunately, this paragraph is every bit as applicable today as it was 53 years ago. And the reasons for that are as follows. So the main reason is that the way the labor market operates is it's a bunch of signaling mechanisms. So when I submit an application to an employer, they look at my education, my work experience, et cetera, and they draw inferences in terms of my suitability for the role that they're considering me for. This task becomes more difficult for employers when you have individuals applying from countries with significantly different economies, educational systems, as well as cultures compared with Canada. And this task has become even more challenging since Canada launched the point system because we have seen a significant shift in the main source countries of our immigrants away from the likes of the US, the British Isles, and Western Europe to most of our immigrants now coming from the likes of Asia, the Middle East, Africa, et cetera. And today, in uh, any given year, Canada welcomes immigrants from some 175 different countries. Discrimination isn't the biggest issue, but it is one that has been proven in the literature nonetheless. One of the most seminal studies on this topic was conducted by a University of Toronto professor by the name of Phil Aropoulos back in 2011, in which he sent out thousands of fictional resumes to real Canadian employers with applicants who pretty much had everything identical except that some of them had English sounding names and the other had ethnic sounding ones and of course the English sounding applicants had higher response rates. One point that I am going to stress in my coming slides as well as throughout my presentation is that most of Canada's immigrants are admitted for non-economic reasons and this helps us understand why they lag in terms of their outcomes compared with the Canadian born population. But this is completely fine and it's something we should be openly comfortable with for reasons I'll explain in a second. 
And so when you put everything together, according to a Conference Board of Canada study released back in 2015, immigrants lose up to $13 billion each year in wages due to underemployment and unemployment. Today, when we measure economic integration in Canada, we tend to focus on common metrics such as an immigrants' wages based on the length of time they spent in Canada because there is the expectation that as they gain Canadian work experience and build their social and professional networks, their wages will rise over time, and this is in fact the case. We also look at labor force participation, we look at their employment rate, and we look at their unemployment rate. So the labor force participation rate is the number of people who have a job or are looking for a job. The employment rate is the number of people with a job divided by their specific age cohort, and the unemployment rate is the number of people looking for work divided by the size of the labor force. It's fine for us to use these metrics, but there are limitations with this approach, including that it misses out on the qualitative element of understanding whether immigrants are working in jobs commensurate with their skills, whether they are in, uh, whether they have high skills or they're on the lower end of the spectrum. Right now, we basically compile all immigrant outcomes and we use the Canadian-born population as the benchmark, and this is not a prudent approach, and I'll explain why in a second. Another important consideration is that the performance of immigrants within the labor market really depends on when they arrive to Canada. If I'm an immigrant that arrives in Canada right now, in 2019, when our economy is doing fairly well, our unemployment rate is about 5.5%, chances are I am going to do very well throughout my career here in Canada, compared with if I arrived to Canada during 2008 and 2009, for example, when we were facing a significant recession and the unemployment rate for Canadians as well as immigrants skyrocketed. Most of Canada's immigrants are admitted for non-economic reasons. And we need to keep this in mind whenever we have discussions about economic integration because it does not make sense for us to use an economic prism to assess all of our immigrants when most of them are admitted for social and humanitarian purposes. Canada's immigration system, as we all know, has three broad policy objectives. To benefit our economy, to reunite families, and to help refugees. And we always have to keep this in mind when we have discussions about economic integration. If we look at the wages of immigrants based on their entry cohort, we see that there are only two groups of immigrants that have wages that converge with the Canadian average and then exceed it over time. And these are the 24% that are assessed based on their human capital under our point system. The other 76% are brought in because they are spouses and children of principal applicants, because they arrive under the family class, or they, because they are here due to refugee or humanitarian purposes. And their wages do not fully converge, nor should we reasonably expect them to. And so, what I want to discuss is how we can be more holistic in our approach in terms of measuring the performance of immigrants within the labor market. First, I think it's extremely reasonable for us to use the Canadian-born population as the benchmark to measure principal applicants after principal applicants have spent five years and over within Canada. Because remember, we have a very competitive point system in which we're bringing in people with very high levels of education and language proficiency and work experience. These are very talented people, and we should expect them to do just as well, if not better, than the Canadian-born population. However, like I've said, it's not realistic to expect the other 76% to do as well as the Canadian-born population. And if we are to make comparisons between them and Canadians, we really have to control for as many factors as we can to ensure we're making apple-to-apple -apple comparisons. So for instance, if someone arrives as a refugee and they are highly proficient in English with an engineering background and they have a lot of work experience, I think we can reasonably expect and compare them to the Canadian-born population. However, if we admit a refugee who is highly vulnerable and they have low levels of education and language proficiency, we should not be comparing them with Canadian-born individuals. 
So what I'll focus on over the next few minutes are these five metrics, which I think will give us a better understanding of the performance of immigrants within the Canadian labor market. And they include uh, immigrant employment outcomes over time, job quality, family income, home ownership, and let's not forget about the second generation. So a cursory glance at this chart which shows the labor force participation of core working age people within Canada may result in one lamenting the fact that there is a significant gap in the participation rates of the Canadian born population which is indicated at the top uh, with the top line compared with newcomers who are people that have been in Canada for five years or less. However, this is not an equal comparison and instead like I've already stated, we should use immigrants as the benchmark to compare with other cohorts of immigrants. And what we should expect is that immigrants will improve their outcomes over time as a function of the policy improvements that we all uh, think about and we try to implement together to improve our immigration system. And then anyways, when we look at this, we see that already there are improvements in the outcomes of immigrants on this front. Uh, in 2018, the labor force participation rate of newcomers was 77% compared with 74% in, in 2006. And as we'll see in the next two charts, um, over time, immigrants essentially become Canadianized within the labor market. They don't fully converge, but you see that, for instance, when they are in Canada for 10 years or more, their um, outcomes are very close to the Canadian-born population. And so what we should do moving forward is always make comparisons amongst immigrants themselves and aspire for immigrants to have better outcomes compared with previous cohorts of newcomers. One of the limitations with the uh, uh, metrics that uh, I've explored with you um, are that they kind of miss the qualitative element in terms of helping us understand whether immigrants are working in their respective fields and based on their respective skills profiles. So one thing that we can do a better job of is looking at the job quality of immigrants. And interestingly, the OECD produces an annual report measuring econo or, um, economic and social integration among uh, immigrants in member states. What I find to be very odd is in their most recent report last year, they don't have much analysis on Canada because of data limitations. And we know in Canada, we collect data up to the wazoo. So I'm not sure what the deal is here. Um, but nonetheless, uh, these are some things that we can consider moving forward to help us get a better understanding of how immigrants are faring within our labor market. We can look at metrics such as um, are they looking for a permanent job or are they okay with um, something that may be more precarious? Are they working part-time because they want to work part-time or because they have no choice? Um, what percentage are working in so-called high-skilled jobs in Canada? We refer to them as NOx, O's, A's, and B's. Um, the share of immigrants who are self-employed is another helpful metric, so long as immigrants choose to be self-employed because that is the best economic opportunity available to them and not because they're choosing to be self-employed because they can't find uh, a job that's commensurate with their skill set. And interestingly, the OECD points to the share of immigrants working in the public sector as another indicator of whether immigrants within a particular country are integrating well into the economy because in the OECD, public sector jobs are respected, they pay well, um, they're secure, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one other thing that we can look at. One of the other limitations in terms of how we look at the performance of immigrants is we often focus on their individual outcomes, even though we all know that immigrants have, or they tend to have, multiple earners in their family. And what we should care about more is their household income because this gives us a better sense of how the household is faring and the household's overall purchasing power. And this is from a study that I co-authored last year. Um, from, uh, it's based on uh, the most recent census conducted in 2016. And if you look at that, immigrant families have comparable levels of incomes as the Canadian-born population with the lone exception being those that are 
um, uh, that have three or more earners within the family. And if you have any insights as to why this is the case, I'd be interested in learning more from you maybe during lunch. If we look at household incomes based on entry category, we see that the economic class and the family class have nearly identical levels of income as Canadian-born households. In 2016, the median income of Canadian-born households was about $88,000. It's almost the same for the economic class, and it's just short of that among the family class. And the refugee class is a bit lower, again, because they're admitted based on humanitarian reasons. A third important metric that we can evaluate is home ownership. This is by far the most important and the most significant purchase we make during our lifetimes, and it's a very good indicator of whether we are integrating into the economy. And we see that immigrant home ownership rates are pretty much the same as the Canadian-born population, 69%. And in a more recent Statistics Canada study that came out a few months ago that evaluates um, the values of immigrant homes in Vancouver and Toronto, we find that the values of immigrant homes are nearly identical as the Canadian-born population when we control for factors such as the size of the house, the, um, the community it's located, the neighborhood it's located in, etc. And what this also tells us is it reinforces the notion that just focusing on the wages of immigrants is limited because we know that immigrants bring significant savings with them and this helps to equalize their purchasing power within the Canadian economy. So perhaps their incomes are not as high as what they could be, but they have a lot of savings, which means they have equivalent levels of purchasing power as the Canadian-born population. And the last metric that I want to focus on is the second generation. Immigration is always a long-term phenomenon, and oftentimes what's lost in the fact is that while the first generation may not fare as well, perhaps because they're willing and are happy to sacrifice for their children, their children are rock stars within the Canadian economy. They have higher levels of education than their parents who are already highly educated, and they have pretty much the same wages as the Canadian-born population, which is obviously extremely positive. And this is something we should never uh, allow to be lost in the discussion when we look at the economic performance of immigrants in Canada. One thing that I think we can do a better job of, and I know that some stakeholders within this room are making efforts on this front, is collecting more primary data to hear from immigrants themselves in terms of how they're faring, because this is going to give us more of a qualitative edge to, in terms of understanding how they feel. Um, do they want to work in their fields that they practice in uh, back home, um, or are they looking to uh, change their uh, career trajectory in Canada? Are they satisfied with their trajectory? Are they satisfied with their current job? And I think one of the benefits of doing these sorts of exercises is we can get um, feedback from immigrants in terms of what they think government stakeholders such as immigrant serving organizations, um, employers, regulatory bodies, etc., can do to help to improve the performance of immigrants in the future. I recognize that this is a very difficult task. Collecting primary data is expensive, it's time consuming, you have privacy concerns, immigrants might not wanna um, disclose this information, you might have a selection bias where people that are doing well are happy to share this information and those that are unhappy are disgruntled and don't wanna talk with you. But I do think over the long run, if we can figure out a sophisticated way of implementing this, this would be an extremely invaluable thing for us to do to uh, continue our culture of excellence here in Canada in terms of identifying how we can do a better job of improving our immigration system. So to conclude, it's not always productive to focus on comparisons between the Canadian-born population and immigrants. We have to make more equivalent comparisons. There's way more to the story than just focusing on wages and common labor force. Uh, characteristics. Uh, we can also look at the second generation home ownership, family income, uh, job quality, and of course benchmarking immigrants with immigrants. At the same time, the reason why we're, we're all here is because we know there is room for improvement. We aren't perfect. And the brain gain study that I previously mentioned found that back in 2015 about one in six immigrants were underemployed. I think we can aspire for this 
to improve to, let's say, 1 in 8 in the near future, and then 1 in 10, hopefully 1 in 12, 1 in 14, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to conclude on an optimistic note because oftentimes this topic is extremely negative. We hear about misnomers such as Canada has a ton of doctors driving taxis. That is not true. Uh, back in 2006, uh, IRCC did a study and they found that there were 220 immigrant doctors driving taxis in Canada. 220 too many, but not a crisis by any stretch. And one of the interesting things as well is there were 20 Canadian doctors driving taxis at the time, which I find to be pretty crazy. Um, so, you no. Know, Based on the data that I just shared with you, we have already seen the outcomes of immigrants improve significantly in recent times due to the changing dynamics within our labor market as well as policy reforms that we have made over the last few decades in Canada. There are currently 9.2 million baby boomers in our country and by 2030, almost all of, or all of them, all of them will be of retirement age. This is one of the most dominant cohorts within Canada's labor force, and as they transition out into retirement, we are going to have a shortage of workers, and immigrants are poised to benefit from this and have already benefited over the last 10 years. We have seen their participation increase, their employment increase, their unemployment fall, and their wages rise. So that's a perfect scorecard, and it's reasonable for, expect, for us to expect this to continue. We've also made some major reforms to our, our immigration system. On the selection front, we have become even more selective through the implementation of educational competency assessments to make sure that the immigrant um, academic credentials are uh, equivalent to Canadian standards. We've increased language proficiency requirements, and this is for the benefit of immigrants to make sure that they can more seamlessly transition into the labor market. We have allowed more international students and temporary foreign workers to transition to permanent residence, and this is sound policy because the research is very clear. Those with Canadian experience fare very well within our labor market. We're also giving regions across the country more selection power, which is also good policy because the research that we've compiled over the last 20 years shows that these folks tend to integrate very quickly. We uh, as we increase our selection criteria, we will likely find that the family class immigrants coming in will have very similar outcomes or, or a similar human capital as the people sponsoring them, as has been the case throughout Canadian history. Bringing in more refugees under the private sponsorship of refugee program should see better outcomes for these folks as well because they're attached to social networks, which the research shows helps facilitate their integration. And we can debate about whether our immigration system is underfunded on the settlement front. I'm not gonna weigh in on the debate, but what I do wanna point out is that settlement funding nationally, including Quebec, has increased fivefold since 2000 and currently stands at $1.5 billion. So when you put all this together, the tightening labor market due to baby boomer retirements, policy reforms on the selection front as well as on the settlement front. I'm very confident that the outcomes of immigrants will be far stronger over the coming 53 years than they were over the past 53 years. Thank you.